So <coughs> previously, I worked on something called GenStream, which was a way to uh, add concurrency to reading files. And last year, I got the idea that <coughs> 10,000 core CPUs are coming. And people are programming with gen servers, which is one process with one state. <laughs> and somehow, that wasn't going to map well to 10,000 cores. So let's see. So how do we how do we anticipate where the hardware is going and make Erlang work well with that new hardware? So right now it encourages a server style programming like Gen Server. You've got one process, and if you look at the code that's been added to print out the state when it crashes, you know that people use very large states in some of their gen servers. And that is something that cannot be distributed across many cores when you're running a large state and mutating it internal to the gen server. And there's no automatic way easily to break up a gen server like that. You could lots of times the API might have some read only functions and then it might mutate part of the state in a few functions and part of the state in a few other functions. And you could actually break the state up by trying to analyze what gets modified and split it into multiple processes. But So that gets you three or five or 10 processes. But if we're getting 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 cores, we're going to need 10 times that many processes to keep the cores busy. So how are you going to write code that has 10,000 cores busy 100,000 or a million processes. How are we going to adapt to this? And there's, there's two ways, really, that are used for keeping lots of cores busy. The simple way is I've got a problem. I solve it on one core. And then I just multiply that problem by 100 and have 100 cores do the problem 100 times. And that's basically what you get when you're doing web services, that hundreds of people hit the server. You've got lots of cores. And you use a virtualization of the OS. But that's not what Erlang programmers, Erlang programmers tend to be writing applications that carefully architect message flows and processes. And we need them to be writing thousands of processes, where today they're writing tens or hundreds of processes. So how do you divide and conquer your problem and get it into many, many processes? Certainly, you need to get fine-grained tasks. Right now, functions tend to grow large, state grows large. And you end up with a module that might have 20 or 30 functions to manage that state. And what you would like to do is shrink it down so that you have 20 or 30 processes, each writing one function, just so that you can get fine-grained concurrency to be possible. The cost of that may be that you're sending messages more than you are now. So the trade-off is going to be there. But if you can reduce the state to smaller pieces that have fewer functions touching them, then you can distribute the state across more processes and get the concurrency. But as long as you keep a large state, you're not going to be able to. So what I'm working on is uh, open source. It's on GitHub. Uh, it's called Erlang SP. That's for services platform to go hand in hand with OTP. Um, and you can include it in using a rebar config. You'll have to wait for release version 0 0.1 to get the features I'm talking about here, which should be in a week or two. Um, and it's undergoing active development and evolution. That means I'm discovering issues and changing them constantly and updating my approach and philosophy to this. But the intent is a library that you can drop in right next to OTP. You can write gen servers, gen FSMs, and you can write these new data flow style constructs and have them interoperate with OTP. They could be supervised by an OTP supervisor. You could use all the OTP tools for tracing and, and managing them. And you could gradually migrate your application, if you wanted to, to using uh, newer constructs. So we're encouraging services rather than servers, where a server is a single process with a state. A service is a collection of processes that's providing functionality that's essentially a subsystem to your larger system. Um, and internal to Erlang SP is a fundamental data structure called a co-op. 
it's cooperating processes. And, and a co-op is actually a graph of processes that are working in concert to get high throughput of data flowing across a network graph. So rather than representing, uh, let's say you have a gen server that has five possible states. Right now, you would represent that with a data structure that could have five possible values. And you would mu mutate the data structure to reflect what state you're in. What I want to do is put the state into a graph so that you're representing the state in the structure and the individual processes that are running. So for instance, if there are five possible values for the state, um, you know, if I use an atom, A, B, C, D, E, there are five possible states, I can represent that as five processes and have a router look at the pattern and route the data to a process that represents state B or to a process that represents state D. And now I no longer need to maintain the state internal to the process because that process is dedicated to only that state, and it only needs the functionality that applies to that state. So essentially, you're taking a, a state machine normally has a state and transitions, and you're taking all the possible states and mapping them to a graph and having the transitions in the data flow so that concurrently, many instances of data can flow across and be living concurrently in different states of the representation. And it's kind of hard to explain that in words, so I'll have a picture in a little bit. To, uh, to, yes. So for an example, um, I work with Tiger Text. We're doing um, texting to mobile phones and things like that, uh, HIPAA compliant for hospitals. Just an example of what I would consider services. And when you're texting, there's presence. You know, is the person online or not? And we have bots and other servers that we also report presence with. So the presence is independent of everything else. If, if I didn't have presence, I could still send messages through the system. The user just might not know whether you're online or not at the time they send the message. Um, the connection listener accepts new people you know, opening up their phone and, and logging in. They get a connection. You could be already connected, and the connection listener be down, and you could still send messages, but no new connections could be accepted. So the services are subsystem functions that are independent of each other. With Erlang SP library, what I want to do is make services a first-class behavior, <laughs> something that you can start and stop and suspend and, and interact with so that you can dynamically reallocate your resources. If, if you expect a spike in connections, then you can turn on more connection services and turn down some of your other services and just have it adaptively um, change the system configuration based on data flow and traffic and things that are happening in real time. So message routing, attachments, you might need an attachment system, but you know, far less frequently than you need presence. So the data flow and demand is going to change from system to system. So the, the goals of the library are to simplify and encourage massive concurrency, and I mean, I want to be able to say, I need a router that routes to a thousand processes and set that up and write a function that looks at the patterns and decides how to route it to each of those thousand processes. And then once I get traffic in, I realize that I don't have enough processes. I want to be able to stamp out 10 copies of that network of a thousand processes. And now I've got distributed load balance 10,000 processes. And it should be that easy to do. I don't want to be writing a gen server and giving it a name and registering it and doing that 10,000 times, because I'm just never going to be done writing the application that way. So automating the generation of a network of processes, mapping the mutable state that currently resides in a gen server to the graph and the way processes are connected so that the path data takes determines the state of that particular computation. And that's how we're using data flow, is that if the graph is in place and data flows from A to G to F, that path 
determines what state the computation is in. And we want to be able to incrementally improve an existing system. We want to take a system that's got OTP constructs and add the new concurrency and see if it helps on a particular subsystem, but leave everything else the way it is. And if that works, then you can incrementally migrate your entire system and still be able to use all the tools that OTP offers, tracing, debugging, all that stuff. So a process network is a collection of processes which are essentially hardwired so that message, messages flow one way through the network. So the way I'm representing it is with a directed acyclic graph. That's a built-in library in, in OTP. You can make DAGs, and they, they actually implement them using ETS tables. So you can have a giant you know, million node graphs and have them all interconnected with lots of edges. And replicating them and all that stuff is all available. Uh, the co-op is taking a graph and assigning processes to each of the nodes in the graph. So basically what I want to do is declare a graph structure like a fan out or a fan in or a particular specific data flow structure and use that as a template and then create co-op instances from that graph where the library automatically populates every node in the graph with actually, it's about seven or eight processes right now for each node in the graph. So if I make a graph that's got 100 nodes in it and then I instantiate it as a co-op, I may end up with 800 processes just like that automatically wired up. And the way it wires them up is that each process has a message loop and it can only send to downstream PIDs. And the downstream PIDs are one of the arguments in the message loop. So I'm not using registered names, which is another synchronization point. And if I have 10,000 processes, I'm not going to come up with 10,000 names. So it's going to be, you know, <laughs> it's difficult to use some of the techniques that we're using now. Um, and having that automatically created for me when I inject data, it just finds its way through the network based on the functions that I've written ahead of time. So I write a module of functions, map those to the graph. The graph populates with processes, and each of the processes are running a specific function task. And the, the purpose is receive data, manipulate it in some way, and pass it on downstream, or filter it and eliminate it so that there is nothing downstream. You can also have side effects by sending messages out to other co-ops or to other PIDs or to other OTP constructs, and in addition, flow the data downstream as well. So if you do a fan out and a fan in, it's like a, a map reduce, but you could also reflect data out from the inner layer to other processes that might be monitoring the graph. Um, and then you glue these networks together. Remember, I'm using acyclic graphs that are directional, the data flows one way. But lots of times you need the data to come back around and get cleaned again or whatever. So you create a graph, and then you create another graph, and then you use whatever OTP ad hoc constructs or whatever you need to wire those graphs together and build your system out of the subsystem components. And so that's sort of why a service maps to a co-op or a collection of co-ops, and then you could turn on and turn off services and change the data flow through the, through the network. Each path through the network is unique because it has to flow through a function and get to another. You could get to the same location in a process through two different paths, and if they did arrive at the same process, that means the patterns that took you to that path led you to the same state computationally. And so you're now in the same state. You may have just gotten there in different ways. But if a path is truly unique, then you would have separate processes for every path. And you wouldn't have two processes feed into one process. You would uh, have a tree structure. But if you need to, you can make graph structures, not just tree structures. <laughs> 
Right now, uh, I'm basically just focused on pipeline and, and fan out and fan in because with those, you can compose pretty much any graph that does a lot of stuff. Right now, the hottest thing, everybody's writing pooling constructs for many reasons, uh, unbridled concurrency or allocating resources, whatever. But if you have a graph that has a single entry point and a fan out, that's a pool. And built into Erlang uh, SP library, the fan out structure can have round robin, uh, random, or broadcast type um, declarative labels on the construction of the fan out. So you automatically can get round robin pooling just by declaring a graph as a fan out with uh, round robin. Now, the trade off is that we're taking mutable state, which was inside one gen server, and we're converting that to a network of processes where the state is implicit in the structure of the network. And we're using messaging to get the data from one state to another state to another state. So whereas before, I might call function A, then function B, then function C, that would happen very quickly because compiled code executing in a compositional way is very fast. Now I'm executing function A and sending a message, and executing function B and sending a message. So you're going to get latency because we've introduced the message passing. But if I send 1,000 data items into the network and they flow across 100 different paths, every path only has 10 data items. So now I'm getting full concurrency, and I'm doing more things simultaneously at a much finer granularity. And I'm also not having to store state for all 1,000 instances. So potentially, my state memory size can be less. less. It, it all depends on how much you can compress the data by knowing implicitly, if I'm in a particular state, I don't need to carry around the data that I normally would pattern match against to determine what state I'm in. I just know implicitly, if I'm in this process, I'm in this state, and only this function applies now. So it is a trade-off, and whether it benefits a particular application or not is really going to be something to be seen. That's why I say this is experiments in data flow. So here's a simple example of trying to explain how you could trade state for a graph. Suppose you just have a gen server that counts and tries to send a message to a subscriber three times. And if it fails after the third time, then it, it doesn't try anymore. Normally, you would have the gen server, and you'd have a counter, and you'd increment the counter every time you send. Instead, you can make a pipeline of processes where each of them sends to the subscriber. The function could be exactly the same in all the cases. If it makes it through the first one and it isn't act by the subscriber, then the second function takes a shot at it. And then the third process takes a shot at it. And then the receiver of the third process is the failure process. So now it's implicit in which process is actually executing the function as to how many times has been retried and whether failure should occur. There is no state. It's just the arrival of the message means that it's now at the stage where it needs to compute whatever that state implies. To make it sensible, you would have a much greater computation than just incrementing a counter. But um, you, get, you get the idea that you're trading um, three state, uh, three valued state data structure for three processes that are linked into a graph, and the presence on the graph indicates what state you're in. So programming with Erlang SP is really the art of disassembling and distributing state. If you're used to writing gen servers, you have to look at the state structures you have and say, how can I take this apart, and how can I map that data to a graph or a structural representation that is equivalent. So it's a tautological thing. And if you, if you look at like parsing code, you end up with a tree, right? If you look at um, scoping of variables, 
it's nested trees um, or, or property lists where you've pushed onto the front. I mean, if you do HTTP header parsing and then body parsing, it's a pipeline. You know, if you see certain things, then you want to be doing other things at later stages in the pipeline. So being able to take what normally is a procedural functional composition and turn it into a graph that represents every possible state simultaneously and uses routing to send the data to the state that represents the computational progress that's been made so far. And that's selecting the network patterns that describe the problem space. So the, if, this is sort of the key chart of what Erlang SP is trying to achieve and what your brain has to do to take advantage of the library. And you need to do functional decomposition. Really, like, boil everything down to the smallest possible function. Like, if, if in, the, in the example of pooling where, I'm, where I have a fan out and I want to route, if I was doing pattern-based routing, so I might have three processes, you know, one works on um, attachments and one works on text messages and one works on uh, images, you know. Uh, the, the head root function might just look at the data pattern as a function with three alternative heads. And if it's, if it's an image, it routes it to one process. And all it does is forward the message. And if it's a text, it forwards it to the other process. So that, that function is just a function head and a PID selector sending a message. And it does nothing else. And as we found out earlier, it generates no garbage. <laughs> so the garbage collector will never run on that thing. It'll run really fast. It'll always be there. You know, it, it's not going to crash. Uh, it's the one thing that we are doing, though, because we're making this lattice of processes or this, this network of processes, we aren't taking an approach where a supervisor sees one process goes down and tries to replace it. Like the, a hole in the middle of the graph would probably be disastrous because it's part of the state space. And we may have lost some partial computation. So a graph is linked completely. If one node goes down, the whole co-op is going to go down. The whole graph is going to go down. And it'll just pull the plug on that one. But if I have a template and I've replicated it 10 times and one of them gets pulled out, the service is still up. It's just degraded. And we can replace the whole service, you know, the whole graph of portion of the service. So it's a, it's a looser coupling, in, but at a service level. Below the service level, it's a much tighter coupling. And this is a, a philosophical thing in OTP that's, that's implied and nobody really talks about. And that's um, OTP gives you constructs with, with uh, the registry of naming and uh, supervision trees and things like that, where you don't need to know the PID that you're talking to. You just need to be able to find the PID you're talking to. So lots of times you're searching in the name registry, or you're looking through other things that you might know about, and getting a handle and sending to that. Or OTP does that for you. You give it a name, and it, underneath the covers, it looks in the registry, finds the PID, and sends it to it. And the reason they do that is loose coupling. If, if the PID crashes, they could spawn a new one and put it back into the registry under the same name, and you would never know the difference. And your code goes by the name. So, it's, it's loosely coupled at the process level, actually, in OTP. And, and it's reflected in the way people write code. They, they write code that uses the registry and uses these constructs and does things one process at a time, like supervision, replacement, and so forth. And instead, here, the, the state is represented in the connections. So the connections themselves are extremely important. They can't just come and go and have be taken away and replaced without you knowing what's happening. So I wired them in so that they work as a unit. And if any piece of it fails, the whole unit will get taken out and it's not contributing errors to the rest of the system. Um, and that's all done by actually using the PID inside the message loop arguments. And so you lose that loose coupling that name servers and so on give you. But but you also lose the synchronization and the serial points that those introduce. The registry introduces a serialization point that can slow things down. 
And when we're talking millions and billions, you, you want to discourage the use of things like name registries and stuff. Um, yeah, at the service level, you do need, you still need dynamic and loosely coupled uh, behavior, but you want to do it at aggregate message flow volume, not at single message or single process volume. So I also say it's OTP compliant. What does that mean? That means that um, the processes respond to system messages. They can be supervised. They reply to exit messages properly. Um, and RHEL tool can ask for you know get modules so it can do upgrades and downgrades and things like that. You want it to be compatible with all the OTP tools so we can just slip it in. It's no different than OTP. And maybe even migrate some of the OTP constructs to use some of these constructs. Um, so here's an example just to show you what OTP compliance looks like for, for people that haven't tried to do a spawn of a proc glib and make it talk to a gen server. Um, this is, I actually grabbed this from my co-op head uh, on the, in a, in a co-op, there's actually a control channel and a data channel, and each of those are represented by a process. And then they hand off to a root process, which talks to the root node of the graph, and then things spread out from there. And there's also a separate um, logging, trace, reflection. Each of those are separate processes. So out of band of the data flow going down the graph, you can reflect trace data or to the browser so you can draw graphs of what's happening live at the same time that the data is flowing through. That's why every node in the graph has like eight processes. And also, because if I've got 10,000 cores, I need to waste the processes as best I can. You just throw as many processes away as you can. That's a sign of wealth, and you, you should burn whatever you have the most of if it buys you benefit in other parts, like simplifying the code. Now my function only has three clauses and no body, and I'm done. It's easy to test. So here. I'm receiving in the message loop. I have no state. This is, this is a case where I've created a co-op head, and I haven't initialized it with a state. It's not ready to do any work yet because it hasn't been started. So it's got no state. It's got its root PID, and it's got its debug options, which is the OTP feature for, for using debug and trace. If it gets an exit message, it exits with reason. That's so that supervisors can supervise it. Um, if the parent dies, it, it reflects the same reason. If it gets any system messages, and that's debugging and tracing and those things. And if it gets the call from RHEL tool, it can say, this is the module that I used when I started up. So if that module's changing in the upgrade, change it out for me. And then these are my internal control messages get handled by this clause. So when you first start it up, it can only handle system messages and control messages, and that's it. And the main control message, there's just one initialize the state where I actually replace this new state, and now it jumps to another message loop where there is a state, and it does the same stuff, and then all the things that it can do once it's started as a service. So this is a trick that's in OTP a lot, and it, it's in Erlang SP a lot, too. Um, you can have two message loops that are mutually recursive. <laughs> so when you're, when you're not debugging, or uh, hibernate's a good example. If you have a gen server that's not hibernating, it's got a big message loop and it can handle all its messages, and then you return from one of the calls and you say hibernate. And it's supposed to shrink its memory down and do all this stuff. And then it jumps to another message loop, which is much smaller, that only handles messages that are valid in the hibernate state. When you're in the hibernate state, you can only reply to certain messages. And then one of them is to unhibernate, and so then you expand to the other full message loop. So you just bounce back and forth between these two message loops. It's a way of changing state. And it's a, and like I'm representing a graph with states, and the processes are states, and they're doing message loops based on the data that's coming to them. It's a natural to have this kind of um, recursion that jumps f between message loops. So I did a talk at um, Vancouver Factory Light. You can look it up. It goes into a lot of depth about how OTP compliance works with Proclib and spawning and the process dictionary and all this stuff. Uh, look that up and you'll see. So a little bit of details. I've added um, something called an ESP service, which is a behavior. That's the services where you can start and stop and suspend. And then I have a TCP service. And that's a fan out for doing 
a concurrent acceptor with, with asynchronous um, INET acceptance. And then as an example, I implemented um, EPMD, which is the, the port mapper daemon. Based on the URL PMD, there's an open source GitHub. So they did it in a way that uses state in ETS tables. And I did it using Erlang SP, eliminating the ETS table to show how that might compare. So um, in the provided behavior for ESP servers, you can create a new service and give it a receiver. So a service, just like a graph, a co-op graph, has a receiver at the other end that can um, accept the data after it's been processed. And that can be another service, another co-op, a particular co-op node. It can be a PID. It can be about five or six different things. So that's how you glue together um, disparate services using sort of ad hoc code. You can start it up and stop it. So when you create one, it doesn't start automatically. And that way, we can dynamically create a bunch of them ahead of time, wait for some traffic, and then turn them on as needed or turn them off as needed. Um, and there's also, uh, you, can, you can create a co-op from a graph and then turn that co-op into a service. And that's kind of another way to upgrade a, a, a static graph into a service that you can turn on and control. Um, you can link a service, because we might want to be doing supervision, or if this service goes down, take down the database connection too, because security's been violated or whatever. So you would link to something else that you want to come down, because there's inconsistency if one piece of the subsystem isn't working. You can get the status, um, suspend and resume, and set overloads so that you can route uh, data based on whether services are overloaded or not. So you could bypass overloaded areas. And what you could have is like two alternate services, one in the normal mode, which does a lot of work. And then in the overloaded situation, you have a shrunken down streamlined service. And so when the main service gets overloaded, you just change the router to switch to the other service until things aren't overloaded anymore. And then you could switch back to full processing. So the idea is to have dynamic adaptability for, for higher throughput, and just have idle processes waiting in case you need them. Um, and act on is, is how you pass data to a service. You give it something and say, act on this data. So a TCP service, I'm using the uh, async accept, kind of the standard undocumented prim inet approach that everybody uses. Um, and Ranch and Swarm are two examples of, of projects that do to similar things. It's a fan out graph. There's the listen socket. So you, you, you do a, a listen, and then you create 100 acceptors. I just spawn a process for every acceptor. But I create a graph ahead of time that's a fan out with however many acceptors you want, and then populate it with co-op processes. And then you just write the function code that handles the accept and does the client module um, calls. So all the other s management and administration stuff is all there. You just have to supply the functions that go inside the graph nodes. Um, and it, one thing about this one is I allow the client module to be changed. So after you launch the acceptors, you could launch 100 acceptors and then say, you know what? The system is overloaded. I'm going to switch to a different client module when I get a connection you can just send a message to all the acceptors. And because it's a fan out in broadcast mode, all you have to do is send a message to the listen socket, which is the head of the fan out, to say, change the client module to module B. And it broadcasts it to all the acceptors automatically. And so you know, one line, poof, everybody knows, it changes their internal state concurrently. And the next accepted socket will be using the new module. Um, and because it's a service, everything's linked, so it'll all come down if you, which is something you may have to work around in your application. If you, if you have long-lived connections, you don't want them linked, because if one person takes down their socket in a bad way, everybody that's connected goes down. So um, what I do in the EPMD module is, I, uh, is actually on connect, I migrate the co-op node to another graph. So it's sitting there waiting until there's a connection, and then it goes to another graph and gets managed by that graph. Um, so 
And then I slab allocate. So, so instead of one process goes away, I replace it with one process. I might have a thousand of them and wait till a hundred of them go away. Then I'll put a hundred processes back. Um, so here's a diagram of how TCP serves. You, when you start it, it does a, a create socket listen. And that then broadcasts to all the children in the fan out to start accepting socket connections. And when a client connects, they get one of these just based on how PrimEye networks. They get one of the processes, and it executes the client module receive that you've implemented. And in the case of EPMD, this function calls co-op migrate to another fan out so that I take it out of this and it doesn't affect any other connecting acceptors. So the broadcast uh, is, it means that you can manage you know, thousands of them without any extra uh, infrastructure. It's all just there. I have no downstream receivers. You see these, these accepts don't have arrows connecting to another process. It just ends, it, it expects to end there. Um, but in your client module, you could receive the data and send it to another process, and then that may be the process. And you could actually transfer the socket if it's on the same VM node. And I don't uh, transfer the socket. I try to keep it in the original process just to cut down on the work that's done. Um, so yeah, there's no socket transfer. You can use side effects in the client module. And then on completion, the acceptor process will go away and do the slab allocation. So now the EPMD daemon, what the EPMD does is whenever you start an Erlang node with a name, it contacts the local socket, and there should be a daemon running there listening for that socket call. And it says, hey, I'm just starting up an Erlang node, and my name is X, and I'm accepting um, distributed calls on this socket. And so the, the local daemon maintains a registry of all the known nodes that share the same cookie and what socket they're listening on. And uh, it comes with the base distribution. It's written in C. That's how distributed Erlang works. Um, you can query the port mapper daemon and find out the list of nodes and what sockets they're connected on. So you know, the normal approach, you have Erlangs that connect to the daemon. The daemon has a registry database. And then clients query the daemon and get information from the registry. And Earl PMD works that way, the typical, and, the, and this is kind of how the C1 works. But the Earl PMD, they've got a connection listener pool, then the ETS table. So whenever your Earl nodes connect, it inserts an entry in the ETS table. And then when somebody queries it, it does a query against the ETS table. It might do a scan. It depends on the query, whether it can go by the index or whether it has to scan the table. But in the services platform style, I use an ESP TCP service, the fan out that we saw earlier. And then the query service is another fan out. And I start it out with no children. So it's a fan out that has a head and no children. And I start that up. And then you start up the TCP service. And if a query arrives as a connection, then I just reply to the query, nobody's connected right now. If, if a connection arrives, then the accept process migrates to the query service. So now the query service has one child, which is one live Erlang node. And if a second one connects, that migrates over there too. So now it's got two children. And if I then receive a query, I send a message to the query service which is a broadcast fan out. So it tells all the connected processes, hey, they're querying for which socket is connected with the name foo. So if I had 100 connected, there would be 100 processes. And in parallel, it would automatically broadcast to all of them, which one of you is named foo and what socket are you connected on? And most of them would say, not me, and throw away the message and not reply. And the one that is foo would reply. And I have no ETS table and no state other than the name and the process ID for my process. So I've, I've taken the ETS table state and turned it into a graph of live connections. And if somebody disconnects, 
even if they didn't intend to, it's immediately disconnected because the process died for the connection and the queries will reply with a consistent result. Whereas in the ETS case, I would have to get the message that they went down and update the ETS table before my queries would respond with a consistent result. Um, so yeah, and if, if somebody just does a query, then I reply and die and eventually more acceptors come. So there's always acceptors just waiting for connections and I can respond to them quickly and concurrently and handle lots of queries without any extra machinery. And route, route my queries to the service fan out, which as I described earlier. Yeah, okay. So the query reply now, let's say I have 10 Erlang nodes connected on my query service. Well, that's an asynchronous reply, right? I, I send a message to the query service and it sends it to 10 processes, which for whatever reason, they may not all reply at the same speed. And if I get a whole series of queries, you know, three or four queries in a row, I'll get three or four messages and they may not flow through that network at the same speed. So I have to be able to bundle the results of a query together because the query might be, tell me all nodes that are connected. And so I need a response from every connected node. So the query response actually spawns a process which sends the message to the query service and waits for the reply back in the spawned process. So, so the query arrived on my accept connect and it becomes the collector that sends the message and waits for the replies back. And by doing that, I can put a timeout on the wait for collecting. And if only eight of them respond instead of all 10, I can reply with all that data and die. And if the other two respond later, the process is gone and so the message delivery just disappears. So we get a live connection and we also get a result based on the liveness of the live connections and the database query is handled independently and concurrently. If I get five separate requests, then I have five separate processes waiting for results and the data is flowing sort of in March step through my fan out. But in Erlang, there's no real timing way to keep them in March step. So they don't have to be a March step. The receiver is given its PID to them for the query response to come back. And so each connected Erlang node is gonna to reply to the PID that requested the query. And so I can have several outstanding requests and wait a little while before I get them all in. And then after the response, the, the collector dies. So this is sort of how the query collection, you know, the collector sends to the query service, it broadcasts, maybe this one gets late, the other two come back to the collector, it sends a result, this dies, and these end up getting dropped. Uh, so the contribution that Erlang SP provided is that we're trading internal state in this EPMD example, the ETS table, for the process graph. Um, the database of connections is actually a graph of processes. The, the, the query service is routing to all of them and collecting back as if it was a database query. And the, the query occurs in parallel naturally. It, in, it eliminates the need for any mutable state update, especially in this case, because you connect and your, your information about your name and your socket doesn't change. Um, and it provides common library pa patterns that reduce the code to implement the logic. And the full OTP set can be used now. So suppose I do a query and I get a list back of six different um, Erlang nodes that are connected, I can query that graph using OTP tools, using trace and debug and things like that, and get more information. If those were gen servers that had more state and were doing more things, I could get the status of the state and do any of the OTP kind of internal probing things that you can do with gen struct constructs. So, what Erlang Services Platform provides is higher level concurrency pattern. I want to be able to create patterns that are hundreds and thousands of processes 
at a whim, you know, just stamp them out. And if I get overloaded, make copies of it and give me 10 so that I've got a lot more throughput. Uh, it, it avoids state-based single server models and tries to map what previously was data structure state into a graph of concurrency that allows data to flow and use as many cores as possible. And it, we can integrate with all the existing OTP stuff and it supports incremental migration of a system to a many core CPU where right now it might be running on 16 cores or something. So these are features that'll be in version 0.1. Um, I think it's 0 .0 0 0.2 right now up on the GitHub. But I'm working on it in my repository, JNL, but Duomark, if you look at Duomark, you'll see uh, Erlang SP and you'll see my contributor name. So if you want to see the latest bleeding stuff that's not into the release, you can look in my local repository. And if you want to contribute, you know, read through it and see uh, if there's anything interesting there. Well, well, so every process in the graph, every node in the graph means that you arrive there by going through some path. So you are in a particular state when you arrive at that process. And because you as the architect designed the graph, then you've made implicit assumptions about what functions will apply in that state. And so that process will only contain those functions that have the behavior that are meaningful in that state. So you would pick the set of graphs before and after. Yeah. Okay. So the state comes between the end. Well, let, let's say, uh, like, like chess is a good example. You know, when they were doing chess, there were these huge search trees, and they said it's enormous. It would take all the time in the universe to search and everything. But if you took every possible legal board position, there's only 4,000. And so you represent a graph with 4,000 possible legal board positions. And if the, the edges are moves that take you from a legal board position to another legal board position, you're now in all the possible states that a chess game could ever be in. And so you can have functions that apply to states where there are no rooks left or, you know, so you're, what you're doing is, is a transformation of the problem space from one data structure type to a flow graph representation of all the possible problem states that you could arrive at. And that way, thousands of instances can all be processed in parallel without dynamically changing what you've set up ahead of time. Yeah. So you, I do that with glue outside of the service, and and th there are a couple cheats in there. Like, um, if you in the when you create a co-op, you can pass in an options flag that says, "Well, let me see the head of the co-op that I'm a member of," because I might need to tell it to like migrate me to another co-op. So, there are some little cheats and holes, but in general, you want to. You want things to flow one direction so that they're very orderly. If you introduce cycles, like because I was implementing it for the first time, Cyclic could introduce all kinds of complexity, and so I just eliminated it and said, I'll do it outside the co-op. But you get a more orderly flow if you know it's directed and can go in a certain way only. You can make assumptions about how you build your graphs. Yeah, so, so uh, I have a co-op instance, but I can turn that into, remember there was a template and I stamped out one. I can turn that into 100 instances of a single node fan out, and those can be put into an ETS table with read concurrency or a process dictionary and then do the routing that way. So, you know, I can, I can stick a fan out in front of that that round robins to those and then it peels off from there. But there is, a, there is a serialization point where you need to have, if you're going to do high volume, you need to have like an ETS table with read concurrency or, so that you can have many processes delivering data in.
and having them hit different processes rather than going through one process, because you'll end up with the same gen server issue. Right. Yeah, I, you know, with a ten thousand core system, if you've got enough memory, you probably have a billion processes. So I, I don't even worry about it. Like, <laughs> you know, and ten years ago, we told the Java people, we have four orders of magnitude more processes than you do. Nah, 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 nah. You know, you're using the wrong approach, and you would think differently if you had that. And now you can say, I'm using four orders of magnitude processes more than you Erlang programmers are using now. Nah, 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 nah. I can do things that you can't do. And I can do really, really stupid things that seem really stupid to you, but on my system, it may turn out to be really faster. Even though it's using a lot of resource, it may have much higher throughput. And that's also why I said experiments. I mean, it may turn out that it just uses too much memory and there's too much latency and it's only useful in very particular situations. It seems to work well with the TCP service because it's just the natural with the, with the async acceptor setup. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, no, no time left. Okay, sorry. Yeah.